بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'm your sister Fatima Barakatullah and welcome to another Elm Feed podcast episode Today I have a guest with me who without knowing it many of you will actually have been touched by her work um, Some of you might have a copy of this translation of the Qur'an in your house, or perhaps this version. They're basically both um, the Sahih international versions. Well, my guest today played a very important part in bringing those translations to life. And she is none other than Amatullah Bantli. Uh, I'm going to introduce her. Salaamu Alaikum, Sister Amatullah. Wa Alaikum, Salaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Amatullah Bentley is the founder of Sahih International, a group of female writers and editors best known for their Quran translation into English. She embraced Islam at the age of 20 and moved to Saudi Arabia a year later. During her time there, she was one of the first women to, mashallah, to be granted a publisher's license. She eventually purchased Dar Abul Qasim and ran her own bookstore for 10 years. In February of 2017, she returned to her native homeland in the USA. She holds a degree in business and is currently an office manager for a public charter school. Jazakila khairan uh, for joining me, Sister Amatullah. Wayaki, sister, it's my pleasure to be with you. And we're so excited to kind of go on the journey with you, I think, and and find out how this all started, because I don't think most people even knew that behind this beautiful translation of Quran, uh, there was a sister like you, mashallah. So please tell us, first of all, a little bit about your background, if you don't mind sharing your, you know, how, your journey to Islam, um, and how your relationship with the Quran developed during your early you know, years, I guess. So I was born into a Catholic family, um, but by the time, and went to Catholic school all of my life. Mm -hmm. But from the time I was young, I questioned things. Um, it just, there were certain things within the church that didn't sit well with me, didn't make sense to me. And by the time I was 16, I was actually professing atheism. I couldn't understand at that point in my life, if there was a God, why did we have war and poverty and abuse and, you know, all the kind of evils of the world? And so I just figured, you know, you have to be a decent person, do the best you can on this life and you die and that's it. Um, but when I went to college, I met quite a few Muslims from overseas who were here studying. And where is this in, in, in America? Yeah, in Minnesota. Minnesota, okay. Yes, yeah. in the Twin Cities, St. Paul, Minneapolis. Um, to be honest, they weren't practicing Muslims, but there was something in their personalities that stood out to me. The generosity, um, the kindness, the concern. They were just, there was something different about them than um, a lot of the American guys that I knew. And over time, you know, religion came up. Um, of course, I had a very narrow view of Islam. I really didn't know anything about it, but had seen in movies the, you know, the typical bad portrayal of Arab men being, you know, the woman behind them and all of that. So I just said, you know, if you think I'm going to live that way, you're crazy without really knowing anything. But little things would come up where now I see it that Allah was touching my fitra. You know, I would just, um, I would literally get like shivers down my spine when little things came up. And so there was um, an American Muslim woman in, a woman in the group. And she said, you know, we're not a very good example of Muslims. And if you really want to know, I'm going to take you to the Islamic Center. So that's oh, where I went. Yeah. And I, the, the person in the bookstore there said, you know, what can we do for you? And I said, well, I keep hearing all these wonderful things about, especially about women in Islam, but I don't have an example. Um, I want to hear it from a Muslim woman herself. And so he contacted me with a group of sisters. A couple of them were American. Um, there were several Malaysian sisters who were 
studying here as well who were in this group and they just kind of took me under their wing they had halakha every week and i went um the first time i went it was time for prayer and you know back in the day the little cassette tape they had of the adhan I had no idea what it was and when i heard it i just started to cry and they said what's wrong you know what did we do and i said i don't know that's it's just so beautiful you know it's what is that and i guess my curiosity was really fueled at that point um somebody did give me a copy of the quran because i wasn't a faithful person i'll have to be honest reading reading the quran you know some people who become muslim say oh my god i read the quran it all just resonated and you know i became muslim from that um that wasn't my path my path was muslims who treated me with decency and explained you know really the beauty of islam and then later on of course my connection with quran uh intensified and became uh important and the best experience i had with quran was when i was in saudi arabia and i was going to um, an islamic educational institute where we not only memorized quran but we studied the tafsir of quran in depth i always loved the section of balagha you know when it talks about how wording is is used and the root meanings and how they're interconnected um that that really brought the beauty of islam to me you know there's some people that are good with language i have a lot of friends who you know went to, to um tajweed school and you know memorized huge huge portions of the quran myself language is a little more difficult for me um, i'm not a great memorizer still to this day when i pray in arabic i still translate in my head back to english so that i get the meaning um but it's I think it's just about committing to spending some time, hopefully daily with the Quran, whether it's sitting it next to your bed and reading a page before you go to sleep or, you know, reading your the short swords every night before you go to sleep. There's you've got to maintain some kind of connection, um, but studying it, you know, really studying the meanings. And of course, a lot of that came up while we were doing the translation, too. So those were also some wonderful years of of learning but we know how life takes us away and we get busy with you know surviving paying the bills taking care mm -hmm. of the kids and i think it's just like the hadith that talks about how our faith goes up and down our relationship with the quran um, may go up and down like that as well but we have to be forgiving of ourselves and and just you know commit to as much as we can so what led to your decision to move to saudi arabia i happened to get married to a saudi Okay, um, and that's why I moved there. Okay, so you arrive in Saudi Arabia. What was that like for the first time? Because it, it wasn't that long after you embraced Islam, right? It was pro about a year and a half or so after I embraced Islam. Mm -hmm. um, I was very fortunate that when I became a Muslim, I had the sisters group. And um, the one sister who I took my Shahada from, her husband happened to be an imam so she was just you know she just taught me so much i had learned mm. alhamdulillah a lot in a very short period and i think that helped my transition in moving to a muslim country i think it would have been much harder if i would have moved there first uh because you get people's cultures you get you know you think you're going to the land of the sahaba and you find out that they're just people too, you know, and um, every place in the world has good and bad positives and negatives. And so you have to kind of figure that out, you know, um, yeah. in the culture. Well, what's cultural, mm. supposed cultural Islam and true Islam. And so that, that those were some challenges, but, you know, my heart was in it. I tried to benefit as much as I could, um, yep. you know, have wonderful friends there still and uh, stay in contact with them. The challenge was when I'm kind of jumping ahead now, but when I got my business, um, not being a native Saudi, that that was challenging, having to work through the system, not being fluent in Arabic, having to have people help me. Um, oh gosh, it, was, yeah. it was quite an accomplishment to get the yeah. job, like the publishing license. Mm -hmm. um, but I just I've always been a very determined person when I put my mind to something unless you literally surround me with brick walls, I will try to find a way to break them down. And I, sometimes that's not a good 
characteristic in a person, but if I wouldn't have had that, I could have never accomplished what I did um, with the bookstore. And, and this again, I can't, you know, like give myself- Can you, can you just say that again? Because it, it just cut out for a moment. You said, if you wouldn't have, if I wouldn't have- If I wouldn't have had kind of that, um, it within my personality, I tend yeah. to kind of be determined sometimes, yeah. almost- Tenacity. In Tenacity and Tenacity. grit, I think they call it nowadays. Yeah, yes. yeah. That's just that's just the way I grew up, you know. And mm. um, I want to always see a challenge in front of me as as uh, like if it seemed to be too high of a challenge, I would find a way to break through it or go around it or whatever. We just got to find a way to make it work. Um, and of course, there are times that you just can't accomplish things. But I have always said that that was Allah's project because he opened doors that I could have never opened. Um, it, it was not doing the translation or even getting involved in Islamic publishing was never something that I sat down one day and said, oh, that's what I want to do with my life. Um, it was all nasib. It was all written by Allah. He just, it, it was a series of events that led to it. And it just happened. It was never an intention. So do you feel like, well, first of all, tell me how, how roughly how old were you at this time? Like when you moved to Saudi Arabia? 20, 20, 20. Okay. Yeah. 20, almost 21. And what was your educational history before that? Like in terms of what were you, what had you been into before? So I went to business school. Um, business I had school. Yeah. 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 Okay. I had a dream of opening a, a deli, to be honest, a cheese shop and, you know, party trays and all of that. I had worked for a cheese factory in high school and absolutely loved it. So that was my dream. I love cheese. <laughs> <laughs> you have to come to London and we, one day. we get all the European cheeses. Yes. And I used to know we them have all cheddar. To sell them, but <laughs> my, my French friend, she said when she came to London, she was like, she didn't consider cheddar to be a proper cheese. <laughs> <laughs> but now she's grown best. to she's grown to like it, appreciate it. Yeah. Wow, okay. So so you had that means you already had a bit a business mind, right? You've moved to Saudi Arabia, but you it's a complete different, it's like a complete lifestyle change, right? Right. And I wasn't even necessary necessarily planning on working. When yeah, I got there. I imagine. So th this is this is the story. Um, one of our friends, her husband was Canadian. He had studied at Omal Kura University in Mecca, you know, had a degree in Islamic studies as well as his wife. And Allah Yarhamo, he passed away one day and they kind of lived on the outskirts of Jeddah. So here's this single mom with five kids, you know, foreigners in the country. A group of us decided until she figures out what she's going to do, um, we're going to all pitch in a little bit and support the family until she can get on her feet because it was a very unexpected passing of her husband. Yeah, so the group had uh, asked me if I would be the one to take out the envelope every month. And when I went out there one day, she said, hey, you know, um, my husband had contracted with the owner of Dar al which was an Islamic publishing house in Jeddah to print mm -hmm. a couple books before he died. And I have the manuscripts here. Could you do me a favor and drop them off at the bookstore? And I said, sure, no problem. However, that day we had happened to have borrowed someone's car because ours was in the shop. And I said, you know, I just, um, do you mind if I wait a few days till we get our car back and then, then I'll take it? Sure, no problem. I said, do you mind if I take a look at them? Because one of them was basically a translation of the treatise, treaties, um, uh, is it Ibn al-Qayyum, on the soul and what happens to it like after death and in the grave. And having been Muslim for just a year, a year and a half, I didn't really know anything about the topic. And I was just enthralled in reading this book. It was so mm. interesting. Um, but with all due respect, the brother, you know, he had been speaking and writing in classical Arabic for so long that his English started to get a little flowery like it is in Arabic. And I thought, this is a great book, but the language, it could use a little tweaking. 
So, so I, were they were they expats? Yes. Yeah, they from... were both expats. He was Canadian and she was from Fiji. Okay, so they were expats living in Saudi, like you guys, right? Like you, and their English was there was his first language, but it it yeah. was. Um, but I think because it was a translation from Arabic or or based on an Arabic book, it it still had more of an Arabic style, and mm. and it just didn't really work completely in English. I mean, it, it was good. Yeah, I know what you mean. You know, sometimes the sentences can run on <laughs> like a paragraph. Also, there was there was almost like a culture back in those times, I think, of like when you would read certain books, they would read like an Arabic khutbah or like an Arabic style reading rather than, and it was almost like deliberate as well. Like they they wanted to put that flavor in it. But like you said, it wouldn't, it wasn't the natural way that you would express it in English. Right. If you were mm. a student of Arabic, you would have gotten it just fine. Yeah. But if you're mm. just picking it up, it just seems a little bit awkward. And yeah. I really felt that for the, I thought it, you know, it was such a fantastic book and what it taught you, but let's make the English flow. Mm. Um, now I'm not an English editor, right? Like I'm a business major, um, but I had a really good friend, Mary Kennedy, who was an English major. And I said, Hey, you know, can you help me kind of shape this book up a little bit? And she was like, sure. So once we got into it, we found that he had, a, you know, references like to chronic ayahs and stuff. And neither Mary or I are fluent in Arabic. And so we did not want to take on responsibility for those translations. And mm -hmm. that's when we brought um, Muhammad, who was our teacher at the Islamic Education Center. Um, you know, we said, hey, will you check the ayahs? Will you check the translation of, of Quran and Hadith in this book? So we make sure that we're not you know, making any errors. So that's how it started. We did that book. We took it to the publisher. He liked the work that we did. You know, we reorganized it, um, kind of rewrote it. And after that, he said, well, would you be interested in doing the other book? And we said, sure, fine. And then he had people submitting texts to him. Um, and he said, well, why don't you start doing this with all of the things that I get? So we basically subcontracted with him any manuscripts that he got. Um, we checked the English and we got them ready for typesetting. Well, fast forward about five years, I've been studying for that time with Om Muhammad and I'm, you know, learning all the, the tafsir classes and learning about the language and, you know, all these things in Quran. And when she would translate Quran, it, it was like, oh, I get that. Finally, I get that. I never understood that when I read that from Yusuf Ali or, you know, and mm -hmm. I just went to him. I told her, oh, I think you should do a Quran translation. And she refused. She said, absolutely not. I don't, you know, I'm not a scholar. I'm not qualified to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what was her background? Sorry, if you don't mind, like, I'm just trying to help people to picture like where the, the various people are from and uh, so Om Muhammad is from California originally. Okay. Um, he had married a Syrian and lived in Syria before moving to Saudi Arabia, I think in the early 80s. Um, in the 70s, I think she moved to, to Syria. And she took intensive Arabic classes while she was there. And it was her. And she Arabic was also an American convert. She was not a convert at the time. Oh, okay. While she was studying and learned Arabic, um, this is what led her to, to convert Islam. To Islam, okay. yes. Wow. yes. But she is, you know, fluent in Arabic and, you know, um, very well knowledge. She would be more of, she doesn't, she didn't go like to a university to study Islam. She was more of how you would study in circles of people mm. or directly from scholarly uh, works and, and whatnot. So she said, nobody will ever take it seriously because I don't have that degree. So she was like, no, I'm not mm. going to do that. But I went to Suleiman Ghassam, the previous owner of the bookstore, and I said, we have, she is amazing. She, she has a talent. She's very concise, precise. Um, she, she will make a person understand Quran in a way that they won't understand it from other translations that are out there. And so we badgered her, really, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> for some time. 
And it, it actually took years before she even prayed a Saqqara. And w- once she prayed a Saqqara, subhanAllah, somebody had just gifted her a set of tafsir books. And she started thinking, you know, well, maybe I'm supposed to be doing this. I don't know. Um, so she finally agreed. Alhamdulillah. And then Mary, Mary is Mary Kennedy. She's from Florida. Um, she was also married to a Saudi, and that's what brought her to Saudi Arabia. She had two degrees, one in um, English language and, oh my goodness, I'm drawing a blank right now. I think it, she studied law. Um, please don't quote me. Uh, anyway, so yeah, it was just the three of us. We each had talents. You know, I did layout work. Um, I had a lot. We all were editors. We reviewed things, you know, quite often. Mm. Uh, it was amazing to me, even as a native speaker, like how much I learned about grammar rules and, you know, a comma can change a meaning in a sentence in English. So you have to be so careful. And Arabic is so much more fluid than English that it, it can be really hard. And especially the Arabic Quran, you know, it can mean more than one thing. But when you translate, you can only reflect one meaning. You you can't reflect multiple meanings in a phrase like you can in Arabic. Yeah. Right. Mm. So again, it's only reflective of the meanings. Any translation is going to be limited. Any translation is going to reflect kind of what style you choose. Are you going to be literal? Are you going to keep transliterated words or are you going to translate the meaning each time into English? When mm. you even even having made a list of common phrases or common words, you can't always stick to them because that same word can mean something different in a different verse like fitna. It can mean disbelief. It can mean distress. It can mean, you know, temptation. Yes. Different things. Different things. It's you can't just translate Quran without knowing the tafsir. Absolutely. And then you have different tafsirs reflect different things as well. You know, so you really have to. Do you know what I love about, about, what I what I'm observing about you and the other sisters that is really beautiful is the attitude of allowing new things to come into your life that you hadn't expected, you know, or planned. Because I, I feel like that openness and spontaneity and willingness to consider is such a uh, an amazing quality because it helps. Uh, even in my own life, I felt that if I just let go of control a little bit, you know, not not to be too rigid, not to be too kind of planning every little thing and just just leave yourself open to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending opportunities or ideas, right? That maybe you, you never saw yourself in a particular position or doing a particular work or maybe you don't think you're good enough or, you know, all of those kind of doubts that you have. But sometimes when... If you if you allow yourself to re, to be open, then when those opportunities come by and you and you and you honor those opportunities, it's like honoring them, right? Like seeing them as a gift, not just kind of because I've met people who I feel like because they're so rigid in what they think they want to do in life, opportunities will come their way. Yeah, they're different to what they had thought. They could be better, though. You know, they could end up being better things. They could be a calling, but because that person is so uh, shut off from even the possibility of considering anything, they'll just kind of bat those opportunities away. But what I like about your attitude and the sisters was that you're kind of you're humble enough, <laughs> you know, to to be like, "Am I really ready for this? Is this really for me?" But at the same time. You have enough uh, tawakkul, I think, you know, in Allah to know that, well, if Allah is sending something your way, maybe it is what he wants you to do. Maybe it is something you should rise to the challenge of. And I just really love that. Well, O Muhammad was asked, what was the most difficult part of the translation? And she said, the responsibility, you know, knowing that if we make an error, we're going to be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this is his word. This is the book of Allah. You know, it's not an essay. It's not a personal opinion. It's true. It's true. Um, yeah. So it, it's a heavy burden. But, you know, alhamdulillah, it seems like it, it, it has been well received and people have benefited from it. 
And that was the ultimate goal. Actually, that's why we did originally, we did not put our names on it. We did not tell anybody who we are, first of all, because we thought that, you know, oh, back in those days, uh, three women, you know, there had never been women <laughs> who had translated. There was, you know, could have mm. been two there. We were afraid we couldn't even get it through the ministry for approval, you know, although the ministry who knew who we were. But, um, you know, but then people wow. started to say, well, how can how you're not taking responsibility for who you are? So then that's when we agreed to put just a short little blurb about each of us at, at the back. But it was also to hopefully to keep our knee up here, you know, to yes. this is a yes. job. This is something we did for the sake of Allah. You know, we didn't get paid to do that job. We did this because we really felt that it could help the Ummah. And, you know, I had been feeling really guilty. Like I said, language isn't quite my my thing. Uh, I, I don't have that gift. And I was feeling so guilty that all I had had all my friends going to Tafi the Quran school and here I was not doing it. And a, another sister said, but and not to say that you shouldn't make an attempt to, you know, memorize and all of that. But she said, you have other gifts and other talents that mm. Uma in a different way. And that. That's true that really almost in, in a way gave me an extra encouragement to fight the battles when there were days that I didn't think we were going to be able to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish because those walls were high. But subhanAllah, really? I swear to you, there were miracles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, absolute miracles in opening doors that I could have never, ever, ever opened. So there, there are three of you working on this together. Did you have... Did you divide the roles? Like, was there like some kind of demarcation of roles or? Pretty much, but then they also overlap. So originally the suggestion came that because Halali and Khan had corrected many of the Akita errors from the use of Ali, that maybe we just tried to fix the English of that. So we actually typed up the whole use okay. of Ali. Uh, excuse me, Halali. The use of we typed the translation up. of Hilal. Is it Hilali? Yeah. Hilali and Khan, yeah. yeah. Um, so we had we had considered doing that, and that's how we started out. We typed up the whole thing, and mm -hmm. um, we're just going to edit it. But then, because Om Muhammad is really the translator, okay, um, she found that that was too hard. And so she went back, and then she made that list of common phrases, knowing that they weren't always going to be able to be the same, but that was a mm -hmm. helpful step for her. Um, and then she just ended up starting over. So then she 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 wrote it all out on yeah. paper, and then I typed it up. And then I also was very, I, I she never wanted to do a tafsir because that was just too large of a focus. But I told her there are certain ayahs that I was pretty insistent these need a little bit of an explanation. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. um, it, it they can't just be left as a straight word for word type. Well, yeah. it's it's sometimes concepts of things, you know, we know that yeah. Quran is explained by by hadith and by scholars and all of that. And sometimes if you put some of those ayahs out there, they're they're the ones that you know people want to attack. Yes, and, exactly. And they're not understood. Take out of context. Yes. Right, exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, you know, like kill them and kill them wherever you find them, kind of thing. Well, yeah. this is when they're, you know, after years of being patient and then they come in and attack you, you can defend yourself right so verses that could be misconstrued um I, I feel like i had a lot to do with what verses needed footnotes and although we were trying to keep those limited we still ended up with about 2000 um but some of them are very brief and, and short but um and then we ended up doing an index like a subject index um there are those kind of books available in arabic and so um muhammad basically compiled that but then we went back and double checked that each reference was actually the correct verse. You know, like there, there wasn't a typo in the number. Um, back in those days, there was not an easy desktop publishing program where we could just put the ayahs in, like side by side, Arabic and English. So we had a printing press in Mecca print out the whole entire Quran to the width of the first edition. And I literally had to cut and paste every single ayah in by hand to match the English wow. that I had typeset already. All oh, right. So, yeah, that was, um, that, <laughs> that took a while. <laughs> I can um, imagine. So it's a painstaking, painstaking work. 
And it was, but but I, it feels like Subhanallah, you you guys were were the right people because also I don't know what you think about this, but because you had that Western eye, you could probably see the verses that needed explaining like needed a little bit more you know do you know what i yeah, mean and even me being okay i was probably muslim by five six years by then but still a relatively new muslim yeah, i'm going to have like, a different eye than um muhammad who i don't know I'm, I'm guessing let's say 25 30 years being muslim and fluent in arabic you know things are going to come natural to her mind that aren't going to come natural to my mind right so mm -hmm. Um, and then marry somewhere in, in the middle, right? So that was, yeah, that was all beneficial. Our circumstances probably really did help that. I never thought of that until you said it, but that's a valid point. Yeah, because uh, again, I'm, 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 I'm kind of noticing the theme here. One, a theme that, you know, sometimes we don't see our own unique selling point like I don't, don't know don't want to call it a USP but it is like that you know we, we don't see our own unique position right um and sometimes other people notice it or sometimes it's almost as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us go down a certain road and then because we even though we wouldn't have said that we're the best people to do something there's something in us that other people don't have so yeah so i really love that kind of it really feels like it was orchestrated by allah oh there's no doubt in my mind you know i mean it, it was just total fate that i happened to be handed <laughs> those manuscripts you know that it just something inside of me actually when i first went back to his wife the first time and said i think these should be edited she said oh no you know shake so and so looked at it and mm -hmm. you know everybody said it's good and I, had, I said, maybe if I bring them to you and point out what I'm talking about, you'll see it. And then once I did, and she had the, you know, it in front of her, she said, oh, I can see where that English could be improved. You know, mm. so her open-mindedness too. Otherwise, yes. I mean, that, that ultimately, if we hadn't had that experience of editing and publishing those other manuscripts, I don't think we would have ever been led down the path to, to doing the Quran. So who was the person in charge of, uh, is it Dar, Dar Abu Al-Qasim? Was it a oh, Saudi? Yes. Um, Suleiman Qasim was a hmm. Saudi a businessman who started Dar Abu Al-Qasim, I think in the very early 80s. He was the first hmm. Islamic bookstore concentrating on books in other language, books other than Arabic, right? Okay. So he had books in hmm. Tagalog, you know, Philippine language um indonesian because at that time there were a lot of laborers in the country from indonesia from the philippines um in english uh he was actually friends with ahmed didat so he had all the early all right. didat pamphlets yeah, and it was the those. only place for us as english-speaking muslims in the city of Jeddah to go and buy books it, this was before oh, dar wow. began as well yeah so um that's where if we wanted a book, that's where we went, you know, and he had imported some books from Pakistan or India or the West, you know, different different places. But that's where you went as an English speaking Muslim to get to get your books. Right. So, um, like I said, we contracted work with him for, you know, 10 or 15 years. And then he became ill to the point where he could no longer keep his business open and it shut down and it was closed for at least a year, if not two. And mm. I approached him and said, you know, Suleiman, I would, all of those books, by that time we had published probably 60, 70, 80 books in association with him. Mm. And I said, all those books are just sitting in a warehouse. You know, I want to open the bookstore back up, but I don't have money. You know, I can give you my life savings, which is that time was probably, you know, $5,000 or something, but you're going to have to give me time get the store back open and I'll pay you bit by bit. What do you say? And Alhamdulillah, because he knew me and had worked with me, he agreed. And um, then it was the legalities, you know, you have, uh, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, that I had Saudi citizenship. You can't, you couldn't have a dar without that. 
Um, mm -hmm. And when I approached him, I hadn't it hadn't been finalized yet. So I told him once I get my citizenship, inshallah, you know, then we can talk serious about this. But I just wanted to see what how you'd feel. Uh, Alhamdulillah, mm -hmm. he was happy. You know, he, he was happy that um, I wanted to open the store back up. So we went through some of the process and, you know, the Chamber of Commerce and transferring the business title and la da 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 What I didn't know at that time is that even though it got approved in Jeddah, there was another step where it had to go to Riyadh in the capital to get like a final signature. And it got stuck when it, it got there. Um, it actually got declined. And so oh. I was at a dinner with some friends of mine and at that point in my life, I wasn't telling people what I was doing because I feel like when you do a big project like that, um, you know, you do it and you get it accomplished and then you tell people, then you announce it. Yeah. But these were my closest little group of friends. Right. And I said, I, I was really stressed. I said, you guys, I do not know what I am going to do. I have signed a five year contract with the building and I started remodeling the, where, you know, the bookstore used to be. You know, I had signed a contract to buy this business and had put a down payment. So all the and and now I'm being forbidden from opening it. And there are mm -hmm. literally two people in the country that can approve this. And there's no one higher than them. And one of the women said to me, well, who's who's the minister and minister? So and so. Well, I happen to know somebody who knows him. <laughs> and I'm like, really and she's a she's an expat. And I'm thinking, how? <laughs> How do you know them? <laughs> you know, um, but this is one of the miracles. Yeah, we made a phone call to a person, and 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 she called me a couple weeks later and said, "Have you received a phone call?" And I said, "No, I haven't." And she said, "Well, I'll try one more time, but if it falls through, I'm not that close. I can't really push the issue." So I'm praying and hoping that something will happen. And I've already, like I said, I've already signed contracts. I was already remodeling the store. So I was in this the space for the store, um, and it was empty and echoey. But we were, you know, making counters or whatever. And I get this phone call, and this man says to me, "Wait for me." And I'm thinking, "This is odd." <laughs> and um, another person comes on about five minutes later and said, "I'm Tula Bantley. Yes, I'm Minister So and So." And oh. Being this naive, you know, Westerner, I know there's an appropriate way to address a minister, but <laughs> you know, this American Westerner, you know, we, we have Mr. President, right? And I'm like, oh, hello, you know, here I'm completely unexpected. Hello, Mr. Minister. <laughs> he thought, oh my God, who is this woman? He said, I hear you have a problem. And I'm like, yes, I do. And subhanAllah, you know, in the long run, I took him information and showed him what was wrong and the papers got signed and alhamdulillah wow mashallah alhamdulillah and that's just and so that was the beginning of you reopening and did you at that point establish sahih international or no sahih international we established from when we did the first editing of the the manuscript so this is we like i said we worked with suleiman for 10 or 15 years and then when he got ill and needed to close his store. So this would have been a, like 15, 17 years later that I took over the, the, the business. So this the business is something separate from the publishing house. So the, the publishing Sahih house is Daral Bukasim, which mm. you know became basically then we could start printing the books on our own, distributing them. Um, but Sahih International is like the editing group. Okay. Right. right. So we we so we basically began as editors, but then mm -hmm. being in the school with Om Muhammad, um, and she just had all of her written notes when she was teaching us. I said, you know, these would be really beneficial for the students to have. So I went to Suleiman, you know, and said we'd like to make some of the books that were, or we'd like to make some of the work that we're learning in school as books to help the teaching center. We could sell these to the students in the school. And then he could sell them from the bookstore. So we had published, you know, um, quite a few books by then already under Sahih International or under Om Muhammad's name or in cooperation with other authors who brought manuscripts that we edited. What kinds of books were they like? What kinds of topics? 
we had a lot of books for beginners, you know, how to pray, basic fit books, but we had three um, tough sears into English. We did Surat al Kaf, Surat Yasin, and Surat, uh, what was the other one? Uh, Nis no, not Nisa. Uh, sorry, I'm just drawing a blank. Um, then we we had Dawa books. You know, uh, we did a book called The Global Messenger, which a, a little bit of a biography about the Prophet Islam, but also just basic information for non-Muslims. Um, one of my favorite books was called Realities of Faith, which was geared to Muslims. You know, when you're kind of going through the week times and need kind of a kick and a reminder, that's a fantastic book. Take it. Oh, Muhammad does not like to take an Arabic book and translate it. She likes to take topics and take information from different sources and mm -hmm. compile them. Um, yes. Because when you translate a book in full, then you can't put any of your own emphasis or your own of course, yeah. you know, um, focus. So she found it was easier to just compile things. Mm. Yeah. Um, instead of just taking a book and translating it. Wow. So <clears throat> it, it seems like uh, men also had a role to play in this, you know, like I think sometimes, um, you know, we, we don't always point out or we don't always notice that in some of the things that we've, you know, su successful women <clears throat> and women who've been able to achieve things, often they'll have men in their lives who, even if they're not like their own relatives, just men, brothers, you know, who facilitate, who support. And I feel like, I wonder if in your journey, you would say that that was also the case because people, people sometimes stereotype Saudi, right? Saudi Arabia, like the idea of, you know, a Saudi, bookshop owner or publishing house owner even you know having that kind of openness to working on these types of things you know people have stereotypes so I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit well that that's one point but we all had husbands you know yeah, and who we course. were taking time away from uh, you know it took us three years from beginning to end because you don't just sit down and go through it once, you know, mm. you, you sit down and you have to proofread it and then you have to lay it out. And then a question comes up or you, st oh, all of a sudden a word, you know, that could be better translated as this. Um, oh, now we need to go back and find all instances of that and change <laughs> it. Or somebody gave yeah. me this suggestion. Um you know, um, when we'd have our little back and forth about, no, there's got to be a comma there because it changes the meaning. But no, it can't because of did it. You know, it just, yeah, how, how much time we spent in phone conversations. And in those days, women couldn't drive in Saudi Arabia. So sometimes we'd actually want to be together to work in person. And so it was the husband's, you know, their work schedules, <laughs> who's going to watch the kids, who's going to, who's going to take us, who's, you know, who's going to pick up food. So we got something to eat. I mean, yeah, there were sacrifices by other people behind us. Absolutely. You know, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, no, mashallah, you know, we have to give a lot of credit to Brother Suleiman for, you know, opening uh, uh, an opportunity um, and, and for trusting us. And, you know, yeah, that's very true. Mm, yeah, I think I think it's important. To, I think it illustrates how men and women, we complement one another. We, you know, we are supporters of one another. And that's where it where I think our ummah thrives, you know, when we take the the best talents of each other and have that kind of synergy and build on that. Right. And then when I was opening the bookstore, there were a lot of legalities that needed to be handled. And, um, yeah. you know, uh, you know, may Allah reward my husband at the time, you know, who, who took on a lot of, you know, had to take work vacation from work and things like that to go accomplish, you know, just a lot of messes that need to be cleaned up. Right. Um, so, Oh yeah. yeah. The bureaucracy, the bureaucracy in those places is because I lived in Egypt and just to get something simple done, you know, like something administrative. Right. Was... Well, even, even simple things, 
you know, because when Suleiman got ill and shut the business, he just it just stopped. And so yeah. like the telephone mm -hmm. lines didn't get disconnected or, you know, the bills weren't changed over. Yeah. All of that yeah. gets complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lots of red tape. So, so where are you all now? Like uh, you and the other sisters, what, do you, do you, can you share with us like any kind of reflection you have on the journey from that point to now? Like, are you all back in America? No, Om Muhammad and Mary are still um, in Saudi Arabia. I, I made the decision five years ago um, to return to the U.S. Um, that was, uh, I didn't think, you know, having come back every year as a visitor, I thought I would just be able to jump right back in because I grew up here and this was my native land. But after 30 years of being in Saudi and just the changes in the world, you know, I, I I struggled. I struggled quite a bit. It was an adjustment. You know, I thought I'd just come back. It'd be easy to get a job because I had been a business owner. Um, you know, I thought all the experience of all the things I had done in my life. But here it's all about what degree you have. And I had, you know, mm. I guess this if there's any lesson in my life story, um, you know, back in my day, you could have an AA and still join a corporation and move up the company ladder and be established. And in my 18 year old mind, um, I knew that I wanted to own a business. And I just said, I'm not going to go to college and study, you know, French and philosophy and all those other things. I want a business degree and let's get on with it. So I only went to business school and had an AA. And so when I got back here, that's not, that's like not even having a GED. It, you know, nobody would, no companies would take me seriously because they didn't have anybody to call because, you know, I didn't have a boss. I was my own boss. Um, and it was, it, it was really hard for me to get a live. I was a single mom at that point, really hard to take care of my kids and get a viable position, you know? So I ended up working in a factory nights and that was, that was miserable, you know? Um, but subhanAllah. Alhamdulillah, that somebody took the chance on me after a while, and <laughs> now I'm back in a field that you know is is suitable to me. Alhamdulillah, but um, yeah, big. So big, what happened to the bookshop in the end? What happened to the? Uh... Well, I was able to keep it open for about a year after I left, um, all because of a wonderful my wonderful uh, employee who had actually been the office manager for Suleiman when Suleiman opened the business, the brother Abedin had worked there, you know, for more than 30 years. And this was one of the other miracles. When Suleiman closed the bookstore, Abedin, you know, went back home to the Philippines, but he, he was able to come back on a visitor visa and he was looking for a job because he, he, you know, wanted to work in Jeddah. And, of all people, Om Muhammad's husband happened to be, you know, in the grocery store or something like that. And he bumped into Abedin. And, you know, I mean, this is like a year after the bookstore had closed down or something. And, you know, of course, Om Muhammad's husband knew that I was trying to open the store. And so he told Abedin, you should try to contact Sister Amkula. I'm sure she would be thrilled to have you back. I mean, look at the size of the world. Look at the situation, you know, what made Abedin come back to Jeddah at that time and be on that street in this massive city and run into Om Muhammad's husband, who happened to know that I was thinking about opening the store back up. This is Allah. This mm. is Allah because there couldn't have been a better person. He knew all of the books. He knew all the customers. He knew how everything ran. And can, can you just remind us who was Abedin? So he, he was the office manager who worked in the bookstore during Suleiman's when Suleiman owned the bookstore. Oh, before he so became, of course, I knew Abedin through all my years of contracting work and buying books. And mm. you know, I knew him as the brother who was the, the, the clerk in the bookstore. And I mean, he, uh, subhanAllah, he, he had, he had found a job and he was thinking about signing a contract but he didn't sign it. And so then he contacted me when he heard this and he was thrilled. He loved the bookstore. Oh. You know, it, it was his life. He came to work in Saudi Arabia when he was like 18 years old and had been working there for over, tw you know, 20 years. And so he was the perfect person. He knew everything. 
so and that I also helped you and it facilitated the whole making the whole journey easier right so he was my mm. only you know employee he stayed in the he stayed in the bookshop both shifts um if he was on vacation or something then i did which you know at that time women weren't really working in places like weren't working in retail in saudi yeah so people would come in and that was very strange you know people but, say that again people would come in and it, it was strange for people to walk into a bookstore. Oh, yeah. There's a female. And the lady was there. there. Yeah. This is, you know, this, the country is very open that way now. Yeah. But yeah when yeah. I opened my bookstore, that was not what women did. Yes. And also men, some would prefer probably to deal with with a male as well. Some um, men, some men thought it was great and other men weren't so keen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is just not the culture. Wow, subhanAllah. So that's that's lovely. Um, can you, like, what are your reflections on the impact of the translation and, you know, the work that you did in general and how it was received? And, you know, when you look back now, obviously you're like thousands of miles away from where you were then. Um, it, does it feel like a different life? Does it feel like it was a different life? And what are your reflections on the impact and the reception? Yes, it does absolutely feel like a different life. You know, my, mm -hmm. my during those three years, besides having to cook and clean the house, all I did was work on the translation. I mean, wow. it was just every day there was something to do on it, right? Or to... Um, so it, it's like when you have a project and then all of a sudden it ends. Yeah. It, um, Is there like a, they say, don't they, that when you have a goal, um, while you're in the process, so you're like you're, cl you're climbing a mountain, right? And like while you're in the process of climbing the mountain, you're so engaged in it that that's actually the, that's actually where you get the joy from, the the kind of, the motivation and then when once you achieve that goal and once it's done and dusted <laughs> it, there's it's almost like an anticlimax or or a feeling of i don't i don't know if grief is the right word <laughs> but no there, there's relief because it was yeah, that's true. Huge, there, there's a part of it <laughs> that's, that's relief that you can kind yeah. of put your life back right but but then there's kind of like an emptiness you know, the, like I said, that yes. connection, because it's not just about getting the wording. You're like, I'm learning. For me, this is yes, a huge exactly. benefit. You know, because sometimes I would ask oh, Muhammad, well, why didn't you translate it this way? And then she'd explain to me and I'd learn more. You know, I learned. So, so the entire much. process, the entire process was so it feels like had so many different. It was helping you to develop in different ways. Yes, it was enlightening. Mm. You know, mm. I mean, I had all these aha moments like, oh, subhanAllah, I never understood that. Now I do, you know. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, it was a great, a great learning experience. You know, I'm it, clearly I'm not the translator. I, you know, I'm the project manager. I'm the typesetter. I'm the editor. You know, um, O Muhammad is the one who really should deserve the credit for this translation because without her capabilities, there would be no translation. Just Allah brought me in as a way to facilitate. It was all this nasib, right? SubhanAllah. But I think like I, I'm, I'm an author, like author of a book about Khadija mm -hmm. and I think so many people go into making a book do you know what i mean like that sometimes i'm embarrassed to take the credit for it because even though my name's on the front cover the publisher has also engaged with me so much you know like in shaping the book and improving it and being like that objective eye you know seeing things that i would not have seen because I'm too close to it, do you know what I mean? And then there's an illustrator who's made the book look beautiful and there's graphic designers who make the, the cover and the typesetting and the, I, I don't know, I think when it comes to a book, there's, there's not one person 
you can really take the credit for it because it's such a collaborative, it is a project, you know? Yeah. Well, there's, there's a sister who never, you know, Mela, forgive us. We never give her proper credit who, um, you know, has memorized Quran. And because we were pasting in the ayahs by hand, you know, she went through and read the whole entire thing to be sure that we put all the eyes in the right, you know, that, wow. yeah. that, that, that there was. And then later on, when we did updated uh, versions, then by that time, there was a program with Arabic and we used it. But every once in a while, I don't know why it was switch the order of words. And so how many times did she proofread the whole thing in Arabic um, to find when there was glitches in the system? You know, and right. then there was another sister, like I told you, when we did that index, who looked up every single reference to make sure that it was the right number. And she did find, you know, errors in the numbers and whatever and corrected them. So there there were people like that behind the scenes, too. Yes, absolutely. But I want to convey to you that we all like here at Ilmfeed, we're so inspired by you all, you know, and we, we're so proud of you that you that you did this project, you know, because it is a ma it's a massive undertaking. And sometimes I, when I tell the story, it, it feels like, was that really me? Because my life is so <laughs> different now, you know? Um, after I left Saudi, I'm not in the publishing world anymore. I'm I'm just a mom, you know, and... and um... Never say I'm just a mom, that's one of my... <laughs> no, 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 that came, my... you're right, that came out the wrong <laughs> way, but, you know... <laughs> Yeah, there, there, there's an emptiness because there was so much. I feel like there, there had to have been Baraka, you know, in, in anything that anybody learned. You know, um, the reviews have basically been good. Some people, okay, so we have to have this balance. The original intention was make it as close to the Arabic as possible so people can kind of get the original feel and that students of Arabic could benefit because it's easier for them to go back and forth between the English and Arabic. But then you also need your English to be fluid, right? And you need other people who pick it up to just, um, if they don't, if they aren't student of Arabic, it, it, you don't want it to feel awkward to them, right? So there's this, this balance. So some people don't like that sometimes maybe we reverse the order of the noun and verb. Or, or something like you. that's not typical in English, but that's mm. impactful. That's how it is in Arabic. Sometimes that really yes. works. Mm. Then when you come to like metaphors or uh, ana analogies or something, those don't translate at all, right? Because you have to have the context of, of the Arabic language for that. So then you get into confusion. But, you know, I, I feel that Um Muhammad really did an amazing job in trying to figure that out. And I think there's been scholars who have really appreciated, like, her way of doing it. There's other people who translate who just know they want to make only the flow of the English be the most beautiful, kind of almost poetic English that they can get. But that wasn't our intent. Mm -hmm. So some people like it and some people don't. And that's fine. You know? For me, like, I, I, I always, I grew up reading when I did read translations, Yusuf Ali. And then I remember when this came onto the scene, actually, I kind of remember suddenly that it was everywhere, you know, like in all the Islamic bookshops. And and the thing I really liked about it, I found it really refreshingly simple. You know, do you know what I mean? Like uh, Yusuf Ali had that poetic, uh, almost archaic kind of beauty, which was nice, kind of biblical almost, right? Um, which appeals to a certain type of person, I think. You know, maybe somebody who's used to the Bible would that would actually appeal to. But this uh, translation was the was the one that I would rather give to somebody. Do you know what I mean? Like in the modern day, like as a gift, a, a, a non-Muslim or a new Muslim. You know, so I really liked the. I, I found it easy and refreshing. You know, as a and modern. It had that modern feel to it you know right mm -hmm. you know uh of course there's always going to be people you know giving criticism some of it constructive and there have been times that we thought well we can see why somebody would think that and we have made some changes over the years but um what we found is sometimes there would be arabs with limited understanding of english and they would yes. say it can't be this because of blah 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 but they don't they are not native speakers of English and they 
oftentimes would not understand why it couldn't be that what was they the were right saying. Word. They would go to a dictionary mm. and say, well, you know, they'd go to an Arabic it's dictionary with English mm. mean, meanings and, but the, no, that's not the way, that's not the way we speak. That's not the way we understand things. That's, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you know, collaborative translation, I think that's actually becoming more, more of a norm now. Like uh, there's this uh, publishing company called Turath Publishers here in the UK. And they're actually encouraging uh, uh, students who can translate. So, or, or even graduates and people who have experience translating uh, to come together in a program that they do to do collaborative translations. They, they're trying to move away from this kind of one person translating things all on their own without any input do you know what i mean right uh, and i thought i thought that was that's much better yeah i think there's a benefit in that too um you know mm. it i can see where it could be too many cooks in the kitchen also yeah um but i think if they have the focus of what's you know uh, like the methodology there's a methodology you you have to yeah. decide that um, are we going to? But be I mean, it's similar to what you what what you were doing in the sense that, yeah, that yes, there was one person who was focused on the translation, but that feedback, you know, and that kind of uh, almost questioning and yes, and and pressing and asking and prodding and like, is that really? That's almost necessary for the process, yes. you know? Yeah. I yes, for I agree it, for, it, for it for you to for, for the outcome to be optimal, right. Right. Yeah. yeah, like I said, the benefit of me not being fluent in Arabic and, um, you know, being kind of somewhat new and, and um, you know, five or seven years Muslim. I mean, alhamdulillah that I had the opportunity of studying during all those years, but mm. it's not at a scholarly level. So th there's still that questioning, you know, things that definitely stood out in my mind that needed to be looked at. And uh, somebody who had been Muslim 30, 40 years wouldn't have questioned it. So, Mashallah, we're, we're proud of you, Sister Amatullah, and, and your Allah, team of sisters. And so, so, what to the future? Like, when you look to the future, what is Amatullah Bantley looking forward to? And are there any other mountains <laughs> that she's planning <laughs> on climbing? <laughs> well, they say variety is the spice of life, right? And I have so many things that I'd like to do that I'll never be able to accomplish. It's impossible. So for me, the challenge is what's, what makes the most sense? What's the most beneficial? Um, and I, unfortunately, I don't think I have the answer to that yet, but I'm maybe narrowing it down. When it comes to the books, I really would like one day to get them all into eBooks and make them available online. Um, just mm -hmm. for, for the benefit, but I just haven't, you know, life has, surviving has taken me away. <laughs> so. Oh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make everything easy for you, inshallah. And uh, I think that's a good place for us to um, end our discussion, even though I, I'm so pleased to have had this opportunity to get to know you a bit better. And, you know, when you meet somebody and you just feel like, we 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 were friends in a well. We don't believe in a past life. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was gonna say we were friends in a past life. And then I, my husband heard me say that he'd be like, "Can we please stay Muslim? <laughs> Can we please stay Muslim during this conversation?" No, um, sorry, I should say that again. Um, I meant you feel like your souls have met before, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, but I actually, really there's a, our soul. The souls have met before. Yes, exactly. You know? yeah, um, yeah. That's why I think we have that feeling when we meet someone. You know, we probably didn't meet everybody back way back. You know, when we were first yeah. asked. But um, well, and even if we didn't, okay, it's besides the point. Yeah. The thing is, is this is the beauty of Islam. You know, one of my best yeah. friends, one of my best Muslim friends, said to me one time, "You know, if we weren't Muslim, you, you probably wouldn't be my type." <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's very honest. We might have to edit this out. <laughs> but I, I at first I took offense, but I know exactly what she meant. 
you know, we come yeah. from very different backgrounds and very, you know, but we are the best of friends. And that's because mm -hmm. Islam united us and we understand yeah. each other. And we have had so many shared um, beautiful moments, you know, together. Uh, but we, she didn't tip, you know, I, I wouldn't have been quite her type, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's the beauty of the sisterhood that we have, isn't it? There's almost like an immediate click, clicking. Right. Alhamdulillah. 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 No, there really, there is, you know, this is one of the beauty of Islam that people unite you. You can go to a city and you can be somebody in the masjid and they might invite you over to your house and you feel so welcome to go, you know. Have you ever been to UK? No. Oh, and where are your ancestors? Like, where do you originate from? Um, from what you know? I Ireland, Germany and Scotland. <laughs> okay. You missed out England. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, yeah, there's a tad of French in there too, but okay, mashallah. So you're British at heart, somewhere. Maybe <laughs> Irish and well, I don't know if the Scots. Mostly Irish. Scots are divided me. about their allegiance to Britain at the moment, but anyway. Oh, just anyway, Jazakallah Khairan. Well, if you do get an opportunity to come to UK, I'd love to host you. I'd love to take you out for. Uh, a cream tea you know that's what we do here <laughs> i'll order a coke but <laughs> <laughs> that's what the brits are known for our scones and uh english breakfast tea so inshallah, inshallah. i have inshallah. Two, two of my other best friends are actually from the uk so yeah if, if i have the opportunity i would love to inshallah jazakallah khairan uh, sister amatullah is there any kind of last message or anything you'd like to share with everybody? I think the, the point of my story is, is how you alluded to it, that you have to let Allah lead you and take control. This is not what my life dream was. This is not what I was planning on doing, but Allah opened those doors and just basically led me through them. And I had to, you, you you feel it in your bones and, and you and you have to do it and it doesn't have to be a big project like this it mm. might just be the sister who's sitting alone in the masjid over there and you're the one that Allah says hey go give her the greetings ask her how she's doing you know check check up on her mm. um you it, you can do things completely silently you know, I had a friend, Allah who passed away, but I found out that she had the habit of every single day, if she had any coins, you know, after being out, she put them in a juice bottle. And this was a woman who was needy herself, but she just didn't keep her change. And she always gave it in sadaqah. As soon as the bottle was full, she'd just go hand it to somebody on the street. Can you and say that last bit again? When the bottle? When the bottle would be become full with coins. Mm. He would just find somebody on the street who seemed needy um, and hand it to them. You mm. know, so we all we all have something to give to the community. It can yeah. be a smile. You know, it doesn't we have to. And, and if you have abilities, um, you know, layout work or, you know, IT skills or videography or whatever it is. You know, use them, make your Nia. There was a sister who said one time, you know, I can dread cooking every day, but if I make my Nia that this pleases my husband and my family, keeps my kids healthy, then I'm yeah. getting baraka for it instead of it being a mundane mm. routine. It becomes an act of worship. Yes. So I'm reminding myself before anybody else because we yeah. get so busy in this life. Definitely. But it's 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 being practical. It's making those niyas and finding your opportunity and thinking about what is it that you can do, whether it affects the whole community or just the, your tight-knit community within your own household or even for yourself. If I'm struggling with reading a page a day, well, maybe I need to read three ayahs, whatever hmm. it is. But there's something there that every single one of us can contribute. Well, Jazakallah khairan, Sister Amatullah. We love you for the sake of Allah. We we pray for you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings you 
joy and benefit, just like you've brought us benefit through your efforts, you know, Jazakallah khairan. Uh, I think there's a piece of you in every in every Muslim home, which is quite quite an amazing thing, you know. That's my Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Barbie. <body. laughs> we have to give all of, all of the gratitude is to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. This is Allah's project. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, and Allah chose people as tools, right, to accomplish yeah. those projects. Yeah, We're just a tool. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. Sister. Okay, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, sister. Okay, jazakumullah khairan, brothers and sisters. I'm sure you really enjoyed and benefited from that. Uh, make du'a for our sister, Amatullah. Uh, go and revisit your translation from Sahih International, and you'll see that this was the translation that we were talking about during this podcast. Please share this episode with some brothers and sisters who need some inspiration and <clears throat> please uh, listen to it, comment on it. Uh, you know, we want this message and we want the inspiration that we try to share in uh, the Ilmfeed podcast to reach as many people as possible. And I think having conversations and interviews with inspiring people is one of the most powerful ways that we could do that. Because sometimes we don't realize that uh, these people exist in our communities, right? So Jazakumullah khairan. And with that, I will bid you farewell. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.